Hi everyone, I'm Dan, the founder of jazzcomposerspresent.com, an online space where composers, musicians, and listeners come together to celebrate the music we love. Our August 2021 events were very exciting. We presented Composer Spotlights featuring Rich DeRosa and Florian Hofner. Our very first roundtable panel discussion and listening sessions with Pete McGinnis, Miho Hazama, Chelsea McBride, and Scott Ninmer. The presenting artists gave incredible insight into their compositional process, thematic development, rhythmic manipulation, and other great topics. The live Q&As with the community were equally engaging. September's events have been a great success, and October's calendar is incredibly exciting. Visit our website to see our entire upcoming events calendar. We also announced our very first group lesson featuring the great Jim McNeely. This is your opportunity to get detailed feedback on your own composition from Jim in one of our live stream sessions. Application is free for our members, and all the information is on our website and linked in the description below. All our live streams stay in the past event archive for 60 days. Become a Premier Tier member today to access the archive and participate in our upcoming live streamed events. This highlights video will provide a good taste of what our full-length events have to offer. Thank you for supporting jazzcomposerspresent.com. I mean, what I'm going to talk about today is storytelling, the idea of finding points of view, maybe, but also I think the idea of when we're thinking about a story, it, it just, I think there's more of a sense of development and you know, adhering to characters and as we appreciate stories in general, whether it's film or theater or whatever. And uh, the trickier part, of course, is music is abstract, so it's not quite as uh, literate, let's say. But I, nonetheless, I think it helps. And I think if you're struggling with composition and you're having writer's block or you're looking at that blank page, part of that uh, unlocking that blockage is is to think about what you want to say and um, I imagine it's very much like a novelist you know what's the story about who who's in it and so forth so one thing especially even if let's say you've been doing a lot of writing you know and you you all of a sudden start to notice oh man there I am writing that thing again you know uh, and so this kind of thing is thinking about a different story right, can help you to avoid what I call a rut, right? Just avoiding that same thing, especially if you catch yourself doing it and, and you don't like, don't like it, you want to find something else, change the story, so to speak. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, a novelist creates characters and develops those characters. So we want to and when we're organizing our musical composition, what are the big characters? And by that, I don't necessarily mean it's not always a melody, okay, or a melodic idea. It can be, but it can be a feeling. It can be any series of devices that, that uh, and I think that's the most important thing, too, is that, you know, we can get so into engrossed in microscopic analysis, which is wonderful, and we have to make those decisions. But when people aren't looking at a score and they're hearing things in real time, they have to process things very differently. So it's really important for us to be mindful of that, put ourselves in the role of the listener and what, what's really going to be uh, accessible or memorable to them. You're gonna hear is, um, this title is called Algorithm. And you see I've hyphenated it because, and then the parentheses are very important here. The subtitle, a 21st century take on a Gershwin tune. So the tune is I Got Rhythm, obviously. And that's my little, these are, or these are my viewpoints, right? So one, the title is a pun or a little joke on the computer term algorithm. And uh, believe it or not, I made a joke like that in passing. And I wrote the whole chart just, just to capitalize on the joke, you know, and say, well, let me do that, you know. So the, you can draw influences from just about anything, you know. And I, here's another thing to keep in mind. Uh, for me, I, I always have two parallel tracks that are working 100% of the time. There's the absolute music track, which we need to have all the technical aspects of music. And there's the programmatic or emotional aspect, which is really critical because most of your audience is going to identify with that side. 
more so than the absolute side. And so you can put that in any ratio relationship you want. Um, but, you know, if I put just algorithm, there's not enough information to, to, you know, suggest what the point of view is, right? So a 21st century take on a Gershwin tune and somebody knows, oh, Gershwin, I got rhythm. And, you know, so already there's, there's a concept of what to expect. This piece is entirely through composed. And I felt uh, there was no turning back. Perseverance, there are you'll hear little bits of disappointment, but the idea is to, to constantly move forward. So uh, when you see the score for this one, you'll, you'll see that everything is constantly moving, um, truly through composed. I wasn't concerned with song form. I'm not concerned with symmetrical phrases, none of that. <clears throat> um, all right, so my main musical characters, I have this ostinato sus triad thing. And that's in the piano. And those pulses, if you looked at the piano part, they go the entire way. They never stop until the last chord. All right. That was my clock. That's my undaunted progression through time and energy. Um, and uh, then we have the primary melody. Like this kind of stuff. And it's essentially a two note motive but it's moving randomly in very different directions to me this symbolizes this idea of searching right we're gonna, i'll try this oh didn't that didn't work i'll go this way i'll try that whatever but it gives this sense of um in some ways not focused right okay so my performance characters right who are my actors the piano i felt was like this whole thing is you know and I just want to start, and I want to start really soft. You know, it's like, or like sometimes you see like a play on a stage, right, with the lighting. And it's really just, you know, there's a huge stage, but there's maybe this one character on the corner of the stage and the light. Everything else is black. It's just this light. So this idea of a, uh, a scope, you know, that you, you've got your, sometimes your piece is like this, and then it could go that way. And it's like a circle that expands and contracts. You can control that especially in a piece like this, let's say, where, you know, it's not a groove piece or whatever. Um, okay. Uh, the piano will have a solo. The bass was the, my first soloist. I wanted to start with a humble beginning. You'll hear the flugelhorn, who has the shortest solo, but his role is a key dramatic moment where you hear frustration in the piece and you hear how that affects the improvisation which results ultimately in a sense of disappointment. So that now we have to build again. And the tenor sax solo, who's got the longest uh, distance to go, uh, he starts us again. Um, and what's happening over the course of that time, I'm trying to present a sense of struggle, that the, the saxophonist is, uh, I'm, I'm throwing more and more band at the sax player, and the sax player has to, to get up above it. And then the uh, next main character is the drum solo. And the drum solo is literally thrashing. And I wrote kind of like what our abstract, if you've ever seen percussion, you know, contemporary con percussion music, or if you've ever seen a conductor do it, it's like, ba, da, 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 ba, 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 boom, ba. you know, and you, maybe it's conducting 4-4, four, four, but the music doesn't sound like that. So that's kind of what I'm going for, this, this kind of just, um, crazed effort or whatever and this undaunted sense of the band working all through it and our first sense that we're really starting to hear uh, coming through uh, all of this in a victorious way is this orchestral trumpet which was played beautifully by uh this player named chad willis who was in the band at the time and you you'll hear the the primary theme in in his uh, instrument. How do you judge whether your musical ideas are strong enough to carry the story you've assigned to the piece of music you are creating? Do you have any guidelines for editing yourself? Uh, well, the editing is, it never stops, I think. That's, and, and you know, I mean, even now, I, sometimes I'll still change something until it's done, right? Um, but I think what's really important is to stay in character. And so maybe, you know, it's funny. 
there's one of my favorite Bob Brookmeyer pieces is American Express because it's got just these all these different little personalities in it. And yet, you know, if you hear first love song, he stays in character. It's the mood is, you know, one thing. So the discipline of learning how to stay in a mood and not destroy it. You know, we have to practice that stay in character. And then once you get good at that, you learn how to do this kind of a, a I mean, if you listen to American Express, he goes through these different little character characterizations, mood changes. Some things are funny. Some things are quirky. Some things are swinging, sassy. I mean, it's it's everything, you know. And you can hear this in in any composer. Um, but to look for pieces that really, uh, by any composer, that really commit themselves to a strong idea. Yeah, I wanted to take a couple of my compositions from, from different periods and ensembles today to talk a little bit about um, expanding the form, working with more than just a chorus form, right? I'm, I'm speaking for myself now, but I, I think a lot of uh, young jazz musicians have to experience starting playing, you play stuff from the real book and you kind of, think that that's what a jazz composition looked like. It's just chords and melody, you know, the lead sheet style. Um, but it isn't really because a lot of these lead sheets, they are simplified versions of more elaborate, complicated compositions that often have a verse and some interlude and parts that are just have been cut out and left out because the real book is just a way to kind of quickly give someone the essence of a piece, but it's by no way the whole composition. Um, and so early on, I I tried to write pieces that look like the real book, melody and, and chords. And there's nothing wrong with it. I still do that uh, sometimes with great results, and it's super fun to play over. But my point is that that's not the only way to write. And you know, you want to be you want to you want to have different ways to approach a piece. You know, you want on an album, you may want to have a lead sheet piece, but then you also may have more developed piece with a longer form in large ensemble composers they may do that anyway but i also find it great for small ensembles to think that way um sometimes to to have a longer form have different forms for the different soloists and really use the ensemble to tell you a story in a longer with a longer form so it's not just a chorus that repeats over and over but we really we, we travel through different places throughout throughout the piece. So uh, I have three pieces um, planned and I just want to show a couple of different ways that I approach that kind of expanding the form and making it more than just a repeated, repeated chorus. So, okay. So that was the third part. So it's a, it's a three part piece with three distinct parts with different chord changes, different melody. Um, and what connects the three parts is the number 24, um, which I have subdivided in different ways we don't just need like often when we think about subdivision we think about multiplication so what's 24 is three times eight eight times three uh six times four but we can also use an addition of unequal parts to subdivide any number so i tried that out and i really liked the results so the way i subdivided 24 in the second section here is five plus five plus five plus five plus four. So I divided it in five parts that are almost equal, but not 100%, right? You see that the last part is one eighth note shorter than all the other parts. So it has a couple of nice effects. Um, first of all, it forced me to come up with a chord progression that has five chords. So a five, five chord cycle, which we don't usually work with um and from for the listener it has this kind of surprise effect because the four is almost like the five so you fall into thinking oh it's, it's a it's a five eight or five four pattern but then that last little bit there always surprises you and then the other aspect about this is having this subdivision represented in the piano 
and the bass. And you can see it in the hi-hat as well in the drum part. Um, now I can, I can uh, superimpose other subdivisions of 24 on top of that. So there's three times eight, six times four, and it sounds completely different again against this uneven subdivision of the number 24. Um, and if you look at the drum part, you can see that the drummer represents all of them. So the hi-hat is, is playing the 5-8 the part. So the hi-hat goes The snare drum is playing six times four. So um, that's six half notes. So that would be And then on the right symbol, he's playing uh, three times eight. So eight dotted quarter notes. So he plays all of that at the same time. And, and that's the beauty of the number 24, that it has those really even subdivisions. Um, and I can set those against my uneven uh, subdivision and have all of them happen at, at the same time. I try to come up with a third part to it, um, contrasting the minor parts. And I used uh, negative harmony, negative melody here. Um, most of you probably have seen that Jacob Collier video a few years back that went really viral where he kind of brought this technique to a broader attention. Uh, it, it was written about by a Swiss musician and theorist uh, Ernst Levy. He has introduced this concept. I won't get into all the details now because this could be a whole uh, session by itself. Um, but the concept is basically to to invert any melodies or chords. So if we have, um, if a melody has an interval going up, you use the same in interval going down. Um, a chord has, like a triad has two intervals. For example, the C major triad has um, major third, minor third. If we invert that, we put the major third on the, uh, on the top and the minor third on the bottom. Um, and the trick with the whole thing is that the axis for the inversion is set between the major third and the minor third, which uh, ensures that if we invert the tonic triad, uh, the inversion will be in the same key. You could set different axes anywhere on the keyboard, anywhere on the scale, but they would result in a transposition. Um, so I use this technique with, with an axis between the minor third and the major third to invert the melody first, and that's exactly inverted from the melody I'm using later in the piece. And then I also inverted my chords, but I was a little bit more free with that. I didn't really stick to it 100%. I inverted it, and then I changed a couple of notes. I used inversions to get more interesting bass lines. Um, and then I came up with this with this intro. And that's maybe a, a general point to make about using any kind of uh, composition system or technique. Um, that's always a great starting point to get to new ideas. But in the end, it's important to use your ear to make the final call, right? We're not writing music to please a music theorist who goes through and looks, oh, well, this is all going to fit the system. In the end, we're writing music for, for the audience. So when I'm using a, a system, I'm always trying to, I always want my ear to be the, the final judge. And often that makes me change a couple of notes, kind of moving away from the system, not sticking with it 100%. Um, and that makes it, you know, makes it more human somehow, more, more natural, um, and that's what I did here as well, coming up with these, with these inverted chords in the background. 
I really love this record a lot and I had never really heard anything like it um, before. Um, one thing that's cool about this record is there's no, I, to the best of my knowledge, there's no improvisation um, at all through this record. I'm sure Scott will correct me if I'm wrong about that, but I don't think there's any improvisation. Um, and then it made me ask myself the question, what, what is jazz and what makes jazz jazz? Because until that point, the answer for me was always the improvisational aspect. And then here we have this fantastic record by one of the greatest jazz composers of all time, and there's no improvisation on the record. So that was kind of interesting for me and changed my perspective on uh, jazz and writing uh, for large um, for large ensemble. Yeah, I think your point about like not writing writing jazz but not having it be the focus be on improvisation is something that was came out of uh, listening to Brookmeyer because there are several pieces that he wrote. One stands out to me called uh, For Maria that he wrote dedicated to Maria Schneider, but that one has no, that was for a big band, but it had no um, improvisation in it, in it at all. And it kind of sparked a debate as to what makes jazz jazz versus just like, is it classical music written for big band or something? Because it has a lot of like tonal classical harmony, but there's jazz elements, there's a rhythm section playing. So his ability to, especially writing for the Metropole, his ability to, to fuse jazz music and classical music is really interesting. And he's using a lot of classical harmony and things of that nature as opposed to jazz. So there's really a great fusion of different uh, styles in, in the work. And that was just a clip of a lot of different styles that he uses across the album. Um, and just also in listening to this, that string quartet section there, he's writing for string quartet differently than we would normally think. I usually think mm -hmm. of string quartet as right, being very contrapuntal. In that little section, he's using them, like it's basically just the lead violin playing the lines and the rest of the group is accompanying. So it's kind of interesting that he used them in that way. Then on different parts of the album, he's using them in a more contrapuntal sort of way where they're all getting featured, but he's also able to use it kind of as a mini uh, orchestra within itself, mm. in addition to being used as a soloist in the larger orchestra. So it's very interesting. Right. That was the thing that I wanted to highlight is um, this is a really, that clip is a really good example of like showcasing the quartet within the ensemble and then everybody working together. And when you're working with an ensemble of any kind, it's really important to think about like, when does everybody get their moment to shine? Whether it's gonna be the rhythm section or your soloist or the person playing the melody, um, giving, uh, giving people those moments where they really get to take over the spotlight for a second is one of the fun parts of being like an arranger or composer. Well, we've selected four comp composer and arrangers that, you know, you're going to hear some of my music, of course, too. But uh, we picked four people. And this was so hard because I, I've, I've been around this music really seriously around big bands and jazz orchestras. I fell in love with this music when I was like seven years old. And I was going to be either Glenn Miller or Duke Ellington when I was eight. I had, couldn't decide. I wanted to be, you know, around in front of writing for playing in a big band from extremely early age. And, you know, uh, so some of the things that I absolutely fell in love with and memorized off records were when I was an absolute small child. So the swing era was a really big deal to me. Then I got older and I heard the more modern writers. And then I got more older and heard even the more modern writers. Uh, so for me to pick four composers that mean something to me personally was incredibly difficult. <laughs> considering all the things that I loved and all the composers I loved. Can you expand a little more on balancing contrasting elements in a piece like those angular lines over a more straight ahead groove? Okay, um, and I think with the Rufus Reed thing, that's another uh, good example of that too. Also with Alan Ferber, um, making, I think what you're trying to do is make things fit together. So the listener can appreciate both elements simultaneously. And I think you, you have to just use your common sense. I, first of all, I think about the elements of rhythm locking, locking in that may be the most important thing if you've got a certain uh, layer in your writing and it has a specific rhythmic content i mean ideally if you want to do some angular stuff and surprising stuff have something that's going to be repetitive so if you do surprising things it'll be less hard for the listener to hear it you can't give the listener too much to listen to at the same time and something's got to be predictable i think what that gives you license to be more 
crazy rhythmically and intervallically. So something more straight ahead. Think about how the rhythms interact with each other and interlock. If they, if they line up too much, too many times together, it, it, can, it can be weird. You, you, you don't know if they're with the accompaniment or if they're separate. So you want contrasting things that are of, of different rhythmic nature. Uh, at times, you may want to look at the actual pitches to make sure if you have a lead, let's say the saxophones have a lead note, and then the melody is going to be doing this. It, too much time around the same pitch is going to make it harder for you to listen to the two elements simultaneously. So there's the pitch and the rhythmic content interlocking and, and with, with the pitch thing being contrasting. That's the best I can offer you, I think. Cool. Um, thanks for that great question. Um, our next question is from Martin, who asks, may I ask about your work process? Do you sketch lots, write a word sketch right away from the piano? Okay. Uh, what I like to often do is write a formal sheet out in advance and I ju I just write some words about what's going to happen when. Uh, and, and it's usually about feeling intent. It may be about if I have a melody I've already chosen, it's like or the melody gets morphed here. The melody gets, uh, for this passage, will be developed. I'll take a snippet of the melody and develop it for, say, two choruses or two minutes or whatever it's going to be. And I'll think about where that appears in the overall form of the piece. And then maybe I want a large ensemble passage toward the end, which is going to be more close to the melody. I'll just simply write those words down. I tell you, if you do those things without writing a note of music, it makes the writing process infinitely easier for you because those, frankly, are the big decisions right. artistically. Those are what really matter the most, more so than no choice or reharms or whatever you're going to do or mixed meters. What's the intent of any given section in the form? So just write basic ideas down, and then you take a step back and see what is this piece really all about, beginning, middle, and end. And I think if you do that, you're writing – that's all I want to say on it because you try that, and you'll be surprised how – how much you'll have more control over your writing. It's not necessarily a big band music. I mean, topic is not today, but I was just thinking as a composer that I am a pianist, primary, my primary instrument is piano. Yeah. And my like motto as a composer is always don't, compose something as a pianist because mm -hmm. I have 10 fingers and then I have a tendency to work in a harmony all the time. And I was actually wondering, because see you, Dan, you are a saxo player. Like, do you work on a composition, a piano or a saxophone? Which one? <laughs> I do both. Right. Yeah, so if you I know, do any one thing. On, yeah. Like if you work on a composition with saxophone, maybe you can, you know, come up with a melody first. And then I don't do that. I mean, I don't have that tendency. So like this listening session is the music that I've been, you know, getting inspired, you know, inspirations in terms of that. What big band album inspired you when you started writing for jazz ensemble? And what is a big band album that has inspired you more recently? Um, yeah, um, since I started playing in a big band in a college back in Tokyo, and that big band played a quite more recent stuff than, you know, classical big band music such as Count Basie or Duke Ellington. So at the time, I used to play a lot of compositions by uh, Gordon Goodwin's Big Fat Band, Bob Froland's Big Band, Murray Schneider Orchestra, and Vince Mendoza's Arrangements. And that basically brought me into the jazz composition world because all the compositions sounded so cool. Mm. Um, recently, more recently, um, I discovered this album uh, of HR Big Band where um, Jim McNeely conducts. Well, Jim McNeely is a music director of this band. It's a really big band in the Frankfurt. And they had a recording with a piano trio named the Furnaces. And um, this piano trio actually just took a part last year. And then I was really sad about it. But these are really amazing young musicians from the UK, Norway, and Denmark doing the piano trio. And um, there is a one British arranger named Julian Argulis. Um, he wrote arrangements and he, I think, conducted, lit the band, HR Big Band, to make album together. 
I can't remember the name of um, the album. Friends is an HR big band, and then maybe you can come up with the um, title, album title. Um, that album speak, spoke to me a lot recently, and I've been listening to that a lot. And um, another big band album that spoke a lot to me in the past five years or six years is the Christopher Azor's album. Um, Chris Bozor is our, Dan and I are, you know, uh, we are friends with Chris. Uh, he's a New York City based uh, jazz composer and his, his orchestra's debut album has been a huge inspiration for me. I think it's listening and analyzing. That's the key that I, you can, you know, absorb so much information from the music. I always really like to transcribe and then I can see how it works and then try to play that on the piano and listen that again with the opera. For me, listening is the best way to learn music for any reason, for any way. So that's how I always, you know, try to absorb the ideas of music. Um, and then, yeah, it's not a practicing, but if you play and then you listen to it, that also doubles the uh, information of the music that you're learning. So I would say that, you know, you can transcribe and then you get really close to the music that you really like, and then you try to play. Then you're, you're getting the information physically by yourself as well. So these are kind of my way to get the idea and then information from someone else's music into my music. So once again, we're sort of going back to the vaults a bit. Uh, this is stuff that I first started listening to in high school. I have a couple things to highlight with this. Um, a lot of it is like stuff I wish I could write, stuff I aspire to write, techniques that I actually like struggle with a bit. Um, and so that's kind of, I'm really excited to talk about that. Um, we're also going to hear from a couple of instruments that you don't normally associate with jazz. And so what I was hoping to do with this session is just sort of get everyone's brain thinking a little bit outside the box. Because I know for me, hearing these recordings was an example of what's possible uh, and what you can do. And I'm sharing this from the perspective of, I don't know if I've learned everything I need to from these recordings yet. And so I'm really excited to talk about that too, because through my journey, especially getting into jazz, it took me a long time to understand even some of the classic recordings. Jazz is kind of cerebral at times, like you have to really think about it. And because I grew up around radio and more popular music, having to think that hard was a skill that did not come easily to me. So in talking about the pieces today, I'm going to share some of the stuff that I like. I'm going to talk a little bit about the performers behind it and stuff you can do with the performers. Uh, and I'm going to explain why I picked these particular pieces and what I'm trying to take away from them and maybe what you can take away from them as well. You mentioned using feel changes in your pieces. When do those ideas tend to come to you while composing? Sketch phase or does it develop later along in the process? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, it really depends on the tune is the short answer, which I feel like is my answer to anything like this. It really depends on the tune. Um, I find I don't tend to incorporate feel changes unless uh, it really needs it because hearing the same thing over can be a little tiring and it can lose impact. So usually I'm looking for a change in color, change in texture, change in groove. And often it's informed by something that came before it. So it doesn't usually happen in the sketch phase unless the main thing that is driving the piece is the contrast between two sections. So a thing I wrote recently for the big band that they haven't even seen yet uh, goes between a rock feel and a very fast swing feel. And it's written the same way throughout. It's all in, it's all in four. Um, but the reason for these field changes was to be able to incorporate some like more beboppy lines uh, to have a little bit looser of a it's it's an instrumental tune, uh, but the melody was supposed to have some room for like longer notes and sort of held over suspensions uh, with faster fills. And so I thought that would be really effective 
uh, if it had the swing thing going and then the swing thing kind of like straightens out and segues back into the, the rock thing. Um, I think with that, I knew the field change was going to be a defining aspect of the tune. So it came up pretty quickly because I thought writing a rock tune for a big band, not super exciting. Writing some jazz stuff, some like straight ahead swing, that could be super fun. And so it was also partly a, a matter of working with the ensemble that I had. It, um, in other pieces, it's usually something that comes from the meter before. I don't do a lot of metric modulations, not for any particular reason, um, but it's just not something that comes up a lot. So when I do uh, shifts, it's usually more like what Florian was talking about in his spotlight where he's changing, taking the same figure and changing where the emphasis is placed. So another piece that I've written that the band hasn't seen yet has a figure that's in seven and five for most of the piece. But because that's 12, at a certain point, it opens up to four, four, and four instead of seven and five. And so that transition is informed by, you know, the other, the meter the piece is in and the other stuff that's going on around it. Going back to last listening session, this will be sort of a running theme, but motivic development. Um, you probably heard some of that in the excerpt we just listened to. That's a big thing I focus on in my writing. Um, there's some canon that I'll talk about, which you also just heard a little bit of in that piece. Um, but yeah, overall, just a bunch of the same, same similar things that we talked about in our last listening session. So. Can you recommend some other classical composers, albums, pieces that interested you as a jazz writer and maybe expand on how you incorporated their ideas into your work? Yeah, um, I'm a big Aaron Copland fan, so that that sort of Americana sound has informed a lot of my classical writing as well as <coughs> my jazz writing, excuse me. Um, I also think uh, like traditional Irish music is also something that I tend to like and tend to utilize um, in my jazz compositions, so I like that. Um, along with the, the Hindemith, um, another piece that's kind of reminiscent of that would be uh, Bartok's music for strings, percussion, and celeste. And that has some of the same, and also his string quartets, those are really informative. So he does great work with motivic development. And I like studying those to try to utilize some of his elements and, and learn how he's developing his motives in order to incorporate those same sort of things into the pieces that I'm writing. So those are just a few, few things I would check out if you're interested. In what ways have you drawn inspiration from music you liked and, and applied them to your music? Yeah, so it goes kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier. If I find a piece that I really like, I tend to listen to it over and over again. Um, one example is uh, in when I was first starting to write for a big band, I listened to the uh, Bob Brookmeyer album with the New Art Orchestra, Get Well Soon uh pretty much every single day because i had about a 45 minute commute to work in the summer so i listened to it every single day for about three months and then i liked a lot of that music so i started transcribing it um just naturally listening to it that many times just i absorb what he was doing and a lot of that was able to come out into my music even though i was pretty fresh at at writing for big band. So that was something that made me really happy. And then transcribing it and starting to see more of the techniques that he was using, um, was a, I was able to directly apply that to what I was write, writing. So that's my main approach. I think everybody has a different approach, but I'm more of like a, a find, find a piece or album you like and listen to it a bunch and get everything out of it that you can in order to um, assimilate it into your own music and eventually accumulate a wealth of techniques in which you're able to make your own music from.